Hello, welcome to another one of my draw along videos coming to you today from my kitchen. Um, and um, this video is going to think a little bit and focus a little bit on the compliment system. Compliment is always one of these things which medical students always approach. And the moment we start sort of talking about it and thinking about it, you know, heads start to explode. And I kind of wanted to produce this to kind of look at the compliment system from a few different ways. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take our time. We're going to go through it in the most basic ways. And I'm gonna present the story of what complement is and why it does from the perspective of an infection. So I'll take you through an infection and what happens, what complement is, why it exists, and then we'll go through aspects of the cascade as well. And the thing about complement is that actually, it's a, it's a really interesting system and it's really important when you're thinking about infection. If we were to kind of categorise it, we'd say it's part of your innate immune system. So you're born with complement, you die with complement. Um, and the kind of the history of it was that in the 19th century, it was discovered when people found that basically uh, plasma from blood minus, so, so blood minus the blood cells um, was able to lyse bacteria. Something in those, in, in that kind of extracellular fraction was able to, to stop bacteria from growing. So what we'll do is we'll draw along. I recommend that you, you grab a piece of paper and you should kind of draw along with me as well, or just, just a few things. And what I'll do is when I record the video, uh, I'll put some timestamps on it so you can just kind of go back and, and watch bits, re-watch bits if, if you're particularly stuck. Double check everything, check with Alex Hughes, check with Michael Dillon, looking at textbooks. Um, there's no script. I have, I have one or two very rough notes about the sort of things I'd like to cover and one or two of the, the terms I'd like to go over. But otherwise, this is just pretty much off the top of my head. Some of the details I may brush over. I have a very much a kind of working knowledge and the perspective that I take from this is very much a microbiological one. And the reason that I think these kind of draw along tutorial things work is that we can kind of put on one or two of the details that are sometimes lost with PowerPoint slides. No slides, just a piece of paper and me talking. Um, so, and with apologies if the, uh, <laughs> if some of the uh, editing is not the, the, the smoothest, but um, anyway, let's get started with some of the details. So what I'm gonna do is in a minute, I'm gonna switch the camera around. But before we that, let's let's just sort of try to summarize and, and define what we mean by complement in a kind of a, like a headline or a nutshell. So if I was to define it, I'd say that it was, um, it's a, basically it's a, it's a cascade or a, a cascade reaction of a series of soluble proteins that originate and are made for, are made in your liver. And what happens is that these proteins circulate around the body. They're found in extracellular fluid and they will, well, they're found in a kind of an inactive form. What happens is that some of them will stick to the surfaces of bacteria and they then catalyze the conversion of subsequent proteins in the, in the complement cascade to become active. Different parts of the complement system do different things. So some are involved in inflammation, some are involved in opsonization. Some are involved in forming something called the membrane attack complex. So let's start by swipping the camera around and going through it all. Okay. So it's part of your innate immune system. Of course, when we're thinking about the immune system, there are naturally overlaps with the adaptive immune system as well. And one of the places that you'll see complement and your um, adaptive immune system overlap is in antibodies. Antibodies are, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation, isn't it? Because antibodies, of course, are coming from plasma cells, which we would say is part of the adaptive immune system, but they all do also form part here of this innate reaction. It's a cascade of soluble proteins. I'm gonna, as I go through the complement system, I'm gonna draw the proteins. It's looking a little bit like this. With apologies, I'm not um, 
John Chilton produces some fantastic uh, cartoons. I'm afraid I'm definitely not John Chilton, but um, I'm going to try to draw this in, in my own way. Basically, what you'll have is an intact protein looking like this, which will comprise basically two domains, which are just called A and B. And there's a hydrolyzable region in the middle. And this can be broken. So one protein can basically, which is in an inactive form, will form an A part and a B part. And in turn, what we may see is that this protein further catalyzes we would just say this is another part of the complement system it further catalyzes the breakdown of that so again it's one one inactive protein becoming active and those active parts then activate another protein the question is what kicks this whole process off? And this is what I'll, I'll try to go through with the, when, when we actually start to look in some of the detail. But this is basically what's happening. When we talk about a cascade reaction, one protein in turn catalyzes the breakdown of other proteins. And once they're in these individual components here, at this point, they are active. Okay, so at this point, they start to do something. but only once they've been broken down. Fine, okay. Went through before some of the functions of complement. Um, again, if you've forgotten what they are, let's just quickly review them. So there are actually a, a few things, again, my th this little tutorial is not intended to be exhaustive, but there are a few things. So it's involved in inflammation. It's worth saying that it's not the only thing that triggers inflammation when you have an infection, but it's one of the first things that triggers inflammation. It's involved in opsonization. Again, there are other proteins involved in opsonization of, and, and if I'll recap very quickly what we mean by that. It's involved in the membrane attack complex. And I'll quickly cover that as well. It also has a role in chemotaxis as well. in attracting white blood cells to the region. So again, just, just, just to clarify, it is not the only thing, but inflammation is really key. When we start thinking about an infection, we can begin to see why complement and why it triggering inflammation is so important at getting or allowing white blood cells into that region. You mentioned opsonization, what does that mean? Well, what happens is that when you have an infection, obviously you'll have a Microorganisms will enter. We'll just we'll keep we'll just keep referring back to bacteria for the purposes of this tutorial, and those bacteria will be phagocytosed. And what those phagocytes will be looking for. So, just go ahead and just draw some lobes and some intracellular granules. What they'll be looking for are specific antigens on the surface, and there'll be a receptor sticking to those antigens. Opsonization basically means that the bacteria becomes coated with other molecules. And these other molecules stick to the surface and it actually makes the phagocytosis happen much faster because now this forms an additional bridge for those phagocytes to stick to the surface of the bacteria. So opsonization basically means phagocytosis goes up. The analogy is imagine uh, imagine a donut, right? And the donut is just plain. And, you know, you can just go ahead and eat just a, a, a rough donut. 
But if you kind of decorate it with some sort of nice sprinkles and you put some chocolate bits all over the surface of it and you put some nice, you know, sugar over the surface of it and what have you, well, then it just becomes that much tastier. And so you gobble it down. Then you sort of think to yourself, hmm, maybe I fancy another one. That's basically what you're doing to a, to a, to a bacteria. That, well, that's, that's an, in effect, what, what, what ops, ops, opsonins um, are doing to the surface of the bacteria to a, with a white blood cell. Um, what else? Membrane attack complex. This is essentially a, uh, well, it's a, it's a series of proteins which form, um, you can imagine this is the surface of the bacterial cell. The membrane attack complex is just a series of proteins which just polymerize in a big kind of circle and they form in effect a hole punch and fluid begins to leak out. So it's it's a it's a useful way of basically killing bacteria. Um, again, that they it has to be triggered, and so it doesn't automatically form. Um, but again, because this is a cascade reaction, it's just one of the kind of outputs. And then chemotaxis. So basically, what what some of the proteins can do is form a gradient. Um, and so what, what, you, what you have is a situation where you'll have a, your bacterial cell and there'll be complement proteins will be activated. And that will then form a concentration gradient becoming fewer and fewer and fewer. And then cells will basically detect the presence of these molecules and they will move up the concentration gradient until they come to the bacteria. So it's a, it's a, it's quite an efficient way of attracting um, white blood cells to the bacteria. So basically, you've got a few things there, and it's worth just reiterating this because, again, sometimes people get so lost in the detail, and they get so lost in the complement cascade that they actually forget what the purpose of the complement is in the first place. There are certain um, genetic diseases, uh, certain hereditary diseases, where you're born sometimes without parts of the complement system. And you're, in some cases, susceptible to recurrent infections because your body is not able to do these initial steps very effectively. Okay, right. Let's move on to the next bit. Okay, so in that first part, we went through basically what complement is and what it does. Let's go through an infection. I'll start by saying one of the most important messages in microbiology, certainly year one, year one plenary, I introduced a few different ideas. One of those ideas is that infection does not equal colonization. So let's just go through what we actually mean by this. Here we have an innate barrier just for the purposes of an argument. We're going to say this is skin over the surface. We've got a pathogen. A pathogen is grown. It's colonized. It's living. It's not doing anything harm, harmful, but it's living its life. And it's all good. Let's throw into the mix now an injury. And that innate barrier has been breached. And it's now allowing that pathogen to escape, or rather, invade. Technically, we would define an infection as, just move this down so you can see, is, is, a, is a invasion of a tissue. That is basically the mesh term. I'm sure you know what mesh means. But it's, it's essentially mesh is just a standardized dictionary of terms. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's a quite a useful way place just to kind of standardize where we're at. But so essentially we've got organisms are colonized, now they're invading. The thing that doesn't always come across when we start learning and thinking about immunology is the very dynamic uh, processes that are happening. You've got organisms that are come in. Now all of a sudden, 
they start to grow. Okay, so we'll, we'll label this here. This can happen fast. Remember that certain bacteria can divide every half hour. Sometimes, so things like E. coli are incredibly quick. And so they are replicating. Now your body, therefore, if you were to design something, your body needs to react to those growing microorganisms quick. It can't wait days and weeks for your immune system to respond. And so it makes sense that there is something happening fast. So there is naturally, here, an automatic response. What do we need? Well, we could have, for example, antibodies. Okay, so we've got Great. Antibodies are important. If you've been vaccinated or you've had prior exposure to a, a related microorganism, those antibodies will cross-react and they'll stick and they potentially can neutralise that threat. That's good. That's what we want. You may also have platelets. Not necessarily involved in the infection process, but again, we've got some tissue injury happening here. And then, of course, we've got complement. Let's go through what the what again what those roles of complement are going to be. Inflammation. Mac. Optimization. All of these things with, uh, just adjust the camera slightly. The thing to remember is that complement is not perfect. Okay, it is, it is a non-specific way of controlling this infection. The membrane attack complex, let's, let's take this to start with. So this is gonna start to work to destroy cells. It's working maybe a little bit slower but it's helping to neutralize some of these organisms. Remember, these are still growing. So we need things which can slow down the growth. Okay, opsonization. Remember, these are gonna be the things which are sticking to the surface. So any phagocytes are gonna now start to be working and they're working to gobble up these bacteria. Okay, so they're working over time. What about inflammation? Well, the inflammation is important and is really crucial at making nearby vessels leaky. Why? Because of course, we've also got white blood cells are gonna be moving in. They need to come out of these of these blood vessels to get into the area. And they are then gonna then move over to start neutralizing the infection. But also that allows the other soluble proteins out as well, which contain more antibodies, more complement, and so on. So let's just think of it from this point of view. You've got an infection, bacteria have entered your complement activates automatically when those organisms are present and that's good because what it's doing is it's paving the way for the immune system to move in you've got those phagocy phagocytes can move in this is aided as well by some of those initial antigen presenting cells so you're thinking about in macrophages also things like dendritic cells and guess what? They're also going to be doing this. They're also triggering inflammation. And that's, and that's required. They're also going to be signaling via their cytokines for those professional phagocytes to come in, such as neutrophils, if it's a bacterial infection, that is. So we've got, a, we've got an, an idea of what's going on straight away. So that's, that's the infection. Next, we'll think a little bit about 
the cascade reaction. Okay, welcome back. So um, I've zoomed out a little bit just so you can see what I'm what I'm going to be doing. Hello, everyone. And in this part, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the cascade reaction. We're going to do this in two parts. So in part one, I'm going to go through the cascade in a bit of detail. And then in part two, I'm going to basically just go through the, the kind of the summary and then and then nuts and bolts. There are, there are two things which I need to um, explain before we get started. And that's a little bit about the nomenclature of some of these proteins. So the naming of these proteins and also a quick thing about antibodies, because antibodies play an important part of this complement story. Let's start with an antibody. I often depict them as a uh, a Y shaped. This is basically kind of often how they're you know how they're shown. In particular, the antibody which I'm just going to show here is IgG. Again, you may remember that there are five types of antibodies, um, and so others such as IgM, for example, are comprised of actually five components like this. What in a ses essence you've got is this bit down here is variable. And this depend. This is the bit that changes in accordance to which pathogen these antibodies can can bind to. And this is sometimes bit. Up, this bit up here is sometimes called the FC fragment. This is the kind of the bit more of the sort of um, the standardised part of, of the antibody. This is important, and we'll come back to this in a second. Now, the other thing is I mentioned the nomenclature of some of these proteins. Complement proteins are called by C and then a number. So there's C1 and they go right the way through to C9. And what we'll see in a minute is that I will then start to refer to some as A and B, and that refers to their kind of breakdown parts. So let's imagine C3. C3 is comprised, as many of these proteins are, as two domains. When it breaks down, it becomes C3A, and C3B. And as a reminder, this is inactive and this is active. Okay, so just so that we're, we're all nice and clear, remember that it's these active bits that do their kind of biologic function. Let's just press that so you can actually see it. Okay. We've got an infection and a bacteria has just entered the system. As, as mentioned before, we need an automatic response. Well, what's gonna happen very early is that you're gonna see binding to the surface by antibodies. I'm just gonna abbreviate it, this is ABS. What happens is that to this fragment, we see the first of the complement proteins stick. And this is called C1. It goes by other names as well. C1 does a few different things, but one of the main things it does is that it converts or acts on the, the, the next step, which is unsurprisingly called C2. C2, which I'll just draw here, is broken down to form C2A and C2B. Fine. It also works a bit confusingly on another protein, which is called C4. And C4, guess what, is made up of two bits, which I'll just draw here in green. And these form C4A and C4B. These two characters combine and they come together to form a kind of a chimeric complex which is referred to as the C3 convertase. As the name sort of suggests, this is a, an enzyme which is going to convert C3 into its active form. So it's going to convert C3, guess what, into C3A and C3B. Straight away, 
I'm going to stop there and say that this is one part of the complement system that sometimes is just referred to as the classic pathway. Okay. This is going to work on the next protein, which, as I mentioned, I'll draw. I've drew, drew up here as as black, but I'm going to redraw it here as orange, just to try to try to get, give some. Uh, uh, well, just to vary it up, really. And this is C three. C three naturally hydrolyzes a bit. So, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that it is produced like all these proteins are, they're produced in the liver. And when they're produced, a small percentage just naturally break down anyway to C3A and B. The way and the kind of analogy that I often have for this is imagine a car, right? Imagine you've got a car running and you've just put the car in neutral and you've left the engine running. This went terrible drawing. Again, I'm not John Jilton. In fact, the exhaust is even the wrong way around. There we go. There's, there's the car. This is kind of what you're doing with C3. It's not really going anywhere. It's ticking over. Small amounts of these proteins are being made. And as a reminder, once they've broken down, these proteins are active. And what it means is that there's always a certain amount of this active complement in the system at any one time. What the C3 convertase does is it puts its foot on the accelerator and the car starts to speed up. So this enzyme basically works to break down C3 to form A and B. The C3B part works on the next part of the complement cascade, move my pens out of the way, and this is C5. Surprise, surprise, C5 becomes C5A and C5B. This protein is important because it's this that basically goes on to form the membrane attack complex, along with basically all the other proteins up until number nine. And this protein is involved in inflammation. We're actually gonna stop the cascade drawing here because we can basically now start to summarize all the stuff that's going on. Let's go right back to the start and just think about what's actually happened. Your, your pathogen has arrived, Antibodies have stuck to the surface and they have effectively started this whole thing kicking off. You've got a few different proteins that have been made. C2A, C4A, and C3A. And these are involved in inflammation. We've got a bunch of proteins which are labeled B, uh, C3B, and these are involved in opsonization. And then down here, we've got our proteins which are involved in triggering membrane attack complex. Remember what this whole thing relies on, partly is the specific binding here of your antibody to your pathogen. Without this here, without the antibody sticking specifically to the pathogen, we don't get the formation of the C3 convertase, which puts its foot on the, on the gas to form these two proteins here. Of all of this stuff, it's about appreciating that it's this complex that's formed that's really important. Now we've actually got a the other thing to say 
is that we've got one pathway here. This is the classic. This is the other part over here. And this is sometimes referred to as the alternate pathway. And my kind of uh, car analogy, whenever I think about the car, I always think of an alternator, which is part of a car. And so basically the alternate pathway is just, it's just the car in neutral until the C3 convertase kicks in. And that's, that comes out of the classic pathway here. The alternate pathway relies on the fact that this C3 protein breaks down a little bit anyway, just in solution. There's more to it, but that's just my kind of uh, nuts and bolts. This is this is basically what's going on. Oh, I nearly forgot. There's one more thing to say, and that is that there is a third pathway involved, and that begin that begins. Oh, let me start again. That begins MBL mannose binding lectin. Mannose is a sugar and it's found over the surface or it's found on specific pathogens. It works very similar. So it works a little bit independently, but it's made up, it's quite a big protein, made up of different arms and they all stick out like this and they effectively work in the same way here. It's effectively similar in the sense that it will stick, uh, maybe not quite as specific as an antibody, but it will stick to the surface of the bacteria and it forms, in essence, like a nucleation point with which the complement protein or this whole cascade begins. So there we have it. Next part, let's go through this again, only a bit less detail and we'll just kind of cut to the chase. Hello, hello. So this part of the video is the cascade reaction but the uh, the Disney version. So let's say complement. It's the complement cascade, uh, as though Disney have kind of come in, have said, "Ah, it's just cut to the chase." So what are we going to do? So earlier in the video, I said that complement was basically this kind of automatic system of proteins which kicks off paves the way for the immune system, elicits inflammation, slows down the growth of bacteria and makes the bacteria that are there a bit tastier to, um, to work on. Pathogens just arrived and our complement is now gonna kick off. There are three main pathways with which this whole thing uh, can start. So it's what we call the classical alternate and something that relies on a protein called mannose binding lectin. When a pathogen arrives, unsurprisingly, you're going to see antibodies stick to the surface. Antibodies originate as part of your adaptive response that will be coming from plasma cells. They will recognise specific antigens on the surface of your pathogen and they will stick and they will begin to neutralise. But what happens is as well, they're involved in starting the complement process off. And at one part of it, a protein called C1 sticks. It looks a little bit like an antibody, I suppose, in its structure. Two arms and then a kind of, um, let's call it a head. And it's this which basically is a little bit catalytic. What does it do? So the C1 portion converts another protein, which is called C2 into which is found in well two domains it breaks down to become an active protein and it also converts another protein which is called c4 again into an active protein two of these will come together to form an enzyme which we call the c3 convertase This is the, is the classical or classic uh, pathway for complement activation. There's another part as well, and this is the alternate. So what basically the alternate pathway does 
sorry if you heard my email beep in the background there, is that it converts C3, which I'll just draw like this, C3 breaks down. It breaks down naturally when it's produced into its two active components. And again, my terrible analogy is think of a car. Think of a car that you're that you're driving and then you stick the car into neutral. Okay. Let's draw it this way around this time. There's your car. It's not going anywhere, but it's also not off either. So it's just kind of running over. What the C3 Convertase does is that this massively, massively speeds up the conversion of the C3 to A and B. Why is that necessary? Well, basically what happens is that the C3A protein is an important pro-inflammatory molecule. And the C3B portion tells protein C5 to 9 to start making MAC, which is the membrane attack complex. This is, we'll just call this alternate. And this is good because this is happening naturally but slowly anyway so it means that there's always some of these mediators around particularly this one which initiates mac should the pathogen suddenly appear so what it basically means is that this is kind of good to go almost immediately this is useful because what it basically means is that your antibodies will stick specifically to the surface of a pathogen and they activate it so there's a degree of control that's given to this whole process I mentioned this last one up here. What about that? Well, the mannose binding lectin is just an alternative way whereby bacteria can be, well, this protein will stick to mannose over the surface of bacteria and that will actually kick this whole process off. So it, it in effect, is just another way of activating this whole process. What these both do is they produce the C3 convertase. This puts the foot on the gas of the, of the conversion of C3 to C3 A and B, and you get all these other things made. That's the Disney version of the clotting cascade. Well, thanks very much, there we have it. So we're gonna finish and we're gonna end on this particular image. We'll just go through just a couple of things to say again. We'll run through the whole thing, but just in a, in a very sketchy way. So you've got pathogens have entered the body. They've started to replicate. Your body's responded by binding antibodies over the surface. These antibodies in turn, as we've covered in lots of different ways, they will result in the C3 convertase forming, which in turn results in pro-inflammatory parts of that cascade being made, membrane attack complex, and, and, uh, and an opsonization from happening. To look at it another way, the inflammation really allows white blood cells to, to kind of enter the region. MAC begins to slow or thin numbers. Remember, it's not working perfectly. MAC does have problems. Um, there are certain types of uh, bacteria that it doesn't work as effectively with. And the opsonization is gonna speed up phagocytosis. And this is all good stuff because this is all allowing, this is all part of a very carefully orchestrated process to allow other more specific parts of the immune system to come in and um, to deal with it. Well, thanks very much. There we have it. So a bit of a run through. Um, some of it not exactly <laughs> uh, well rehearsed. Keen to know what you think. Keen to know if you want me to do more of these things. Aimed at year one students. Um, again, the key things. Think about what triggers complement. 
think about what the outputs are and just become a little bit familiar with some of the steps in the middle. Don't do the flip side, which is spend so long focusing and learning the cascade that you lose sight of why does this thing need to exist? It's important to think about complement because importantly, if you're, let's say, immunosuppressed, or if you've got, you know, very uh, suppressed or, or reduced white blood cell function, you can still trigger an inflammatory reaction to a pathogen when, you've been, when you're exposed to it. And that can explain why sometimes you can get um, patients that are, for example, neutropenic can respond to a pathogen even if they don't have many white blood cells to do so, because the complement system is still kicking in, providing their liver is still okay, they're still producing this stuff. And that's a problem because their body can become, um, you know, you can you can see that sort of systemic reaction to a pathogen without some of the kind of downstream symptoms that you may expect to find, such as, for example, a fever, which can often re you know, rely on the presence of certain white blood cells. Any questions, get in contact. I hope that was useful.